Reggae Boys commentary, like, share, and subscribe. Yes, Reggae Boys commentary, like, and subscribe, yeah? Reggae Boys commentary, <laughs> subscribe, like, and share. Is that the right order? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Darren Moore, and you're watching Reggae Boys commentary. Welcome back to Reggae Boys Commentary. This is another video where we come together to discuss everything in relation to Jamaican football. Today we're on another trip and we go not in Manchester, not to Leeds, but we go over to Crewe. And Crewe is another environment. Yes, that is right. And we're going to meet with somebody extremely special. Are you guys ready? Yes. Well, here we go. So we'll have with us today one of my footballing heroes and an absolute legend for Jamaican and Stoke City as well, Ricardo Fuller. Ricardo, how are you doing? How's the family doing? Thank you for inviting me all the way to Staffordshire. Yes, man, it's a pleasure and honor to be here, Simon. And the uh, family is great, can't complain, and everybody's keeping safe. And, and firstly, congrats on the opportunity that you're receiving at Stoke. You know, what would you say is the, the proper title of it? Because, you know, sometimes you see different roles, responsibilities, but the title of your, your role right now at the club itself? Well, the initiative is, is, is the, is the P, PPCS, which is Professional Player to Code Scheme. It's a new initiative, uh, well, fairly new. It's going on for about two to three years now. Uh, basically, it's, it's inclusiveness, um, diversity, uh, inclusiveness meaning male or female, um, diversity meaning more black and Asian coaches to get involved in the game and equality yeah. um, side of things. Um, and basically, this opportunity had me working with it. its partnership with the Premier League, the EFL and Professional um, Player Football Association, the PFA. Uh, my role is working with the academy structure through the academy structure from under nines um, all the way up into the league team. Um, and obviously I have insights and working as well into the sports science side of things and the recruitment side of things as well. Now, <clears throat> we know from on the island that you've been working on the UEFA coaching badges and everything. Is that something that is finished now for you in terms of UEFA B license and stuff? Yes, I've completed that about um, four or five months ago. Um, that's prior to me, you know, um, um, moving towards the application and when Stoke City asked me to apply for the position. Um, from, the, from, this, from this new initiative, so it's B minimum, so therefore you have to have the B to work in, in any proper football academy setup, uh, which is at club level. So I passed that, and uh, I guess my presentation was brilliant. <laughs> so they've asked me to apply for this role, and um, yeah, it's a lot of bright minds that involved with this initiative. So we got three different groups: the P PPCS, which is the Professional Player Code Scheme. We got the ECAS. And we got another group called MIDS. So it's about 22 of us from various backgrounds and qualifications and inclusive, and inclusive as I say, male or female, um, with this new role um, at different different clubs across the clubs that are involved with it, with this initiative across the, the, the country. It's amazing how time flies by so quickly because it was 10 years ago that was you know your last appearance for the club as a player, and now 10 years onwards because 2012 was the last time, and now we're in 2022 now. Yes. It's amazing how time flies. 10 year anniversary of that last appearance for Stoke. So when this opportunity came, was it the chairman that came or a former player that that said you uh, about this role in particular? No, it's the academy director actually rang me up. Um um, in person, because obviously, you know, I'm still part of the club. I still go to the home games with my son to watch the home games. Um, I've done, I've been doing a lot of charity work in and around the area, because that's what ex players do, you know, for the fans. You know, I've been a massive part of the fans, and they love me here, and I re and I love them as well. So, um, and the, the owners as well have got great love for me as well and, and respect. Um, so they've always asked me to come as um, soon as my badge was my youth degree was completed, because it's been minimum to start working. It's the law and it's the rules. Um, so they were just, I guess they were waiting on that. So as soon as they knew that I was about to complete from the FA and the, and the PFA, um, they made it clear uh, that I asked me to apply for, the, for this position because they think it would be a great opportunity for me to give back to the club as well and working with the club as well and being someone that the club look up to and being a massive part of the club's um, success, mm -hmm. a recent success, I would say. So um, yeah, that kind of a director who rang me personally. And how does it feel to mesh and you know be working with individuals that you once played with as well? You know, in, towards a promotion push to the Premier League and also in the Premier League itself. Absolutely massive, massive. As I say, it's a massive plus in any way you look at it. Um, me being a part of the of the club's recent history in terms of success, um, 
and other players. We've got players as well like Liam Lawrence who are actually at the club as well. Um, Danny Pugh on the 18th, Liam on the 16th, Carl Dickinson on the 12th, Rory Dilap with the senior with the first team, uh, Mama Sidibe with um, with, the, with the recruitment and um, and scouting. So it's a massive plus because when you look at clubs like Man United, uh, Man City, um, Chelsea, Arsenal, all those top clubs who have, who have been Premier League winners, Champions League winners, FA Cup winners, Carling Cup winners, massive clubs who achieve so much. What do they have got in common? Most of their ex-players are working throughout the academy. So you could say or call it as a, a formula for success, especially when you when you got players who do well for club. It's nice to have players that's coming in, see and know what is the club, what the club represent, what this player represent. You know, you got Liam Lawrence, you got uh, Louis Dilap, you got Mama Sidibe, you got Ricardo Fuller now at the club. You know what it meant to play for the club, what you need to give to achieve success for the club. Because we were part of a successful part of um, era for the club. So it's a massive plus, I mean, and, and obviously those players looking in, and you, can, you know, first they arrive, you can see the joy in their face, you can see the excitement, you can see them, they want to say something, you can see the buzz, um, you can see a pep in their step as well because the way they're looking at me all the time, the way they're, you know, and I'm talking from the under nines all the way up to the to the twenty ones, which I was involved with last night. I mean, it's a great result. We should have won by five or six in the end. We drew the game, but to see that fighting spirit, never give up. And, that, that last minute equalizer at the end was a part of my era. We never say die, we never give up. We, we outrun teams, we outplay teams, we outcompete teams, we outwork teams, and we outthink teams. And that's what you know I want to represent for the club. Yeah, and you know, when you joined the club in 2006 as a player, did you recognize the, the magnitude or size of the club, bearing in mind players such as a Stanley Matthews played for this club, or the history in itself didn't really? Um, resonate with you at that time? No, it never did at that time. It never did. I've got to be honest. Um, when I when I first heard about the club, Danny in bottom, I was at Southampton. Obviously, I got a year left on the contract, and uh, we did very well. We did very well at the time. Come back from loan from Ipswich, and Danny, Danny in bottom rang me and said, "You know, Rick, um, I'm at Stoke City Football Club, and you know, I've, the manager loves you, um, and this club is very ambitious. The owners just really, you know, for just." for the community and, and, and they're actually stoke people and they want to, to do great things with this club. And just by Danny Gimbatam, who was my teammate at Southampton, you know, telling me telling me all those things. I could hear the passion in his voice and I know what Danny's like. Top lad, top player, top professional. Um, I just say yes. Because sometimes you get that feeling, even though I got one year left on the contract. And and when the manager rang me and said, you know, you know, we'd like to have here. I've played against him before when I was at Preston, when he was at Plymouth I got Argyle, and I used to score against his teams, and he's always coming over and saying, well done, well done young man, well done lad, or, you know, well done Rick. And so I've always liked him, and, and I always have, my spirit was always good towards him, because sometimes you can sense people. Um, so it's like a match made in heaven, and, and no wonder why he became obviously the best manager that I've worked with. I've had six years worth of lots of success here at the club. But when I arrived here at Stoke City, after taking a 40% pay cut to come here, because remember, Southampton was a Premier League club, we just got relegated. So I was on Premier League wages. So at the time, Stoke was just, I think, League, yeah, league um, 1, or, or probably was Division 2, they won at the time. But anyway, they were in the third tier, and then I think they got promoted to the second tier. Um, and then, yes, when I arrived, we didn't even own a training ground. We were renting, the Clayton Woods were renting off Michelin, the tire, the tire giants. Um, and when I arrived, the, the grass was this high. So, so it was basically lots of animal cows was there, but we had a football field there. And we had a porter cabin, which we got from um, Aston Villa, it was actually a used one. We didn't even have an academy. So this is where we're coming from. So that was just showing you the magnitude of where we're coming from to where we are now. We have a Cat One facility, unbelievable setup, unbelievable um, stadium, um, training ground. It's just a shame we couldn't get to go there today um, to, so we could see the beauty. Um, but yeah, it was unbelievable and it's just one of them where um, um, it was just from, if you want to say from nothing to something, because we have a good, we have good preparation, we have good leadership, good preparation, good recruitment. You know, the group, the guys during my time, the Rory Dilap, the Liam Lawrence, the Mama City Biz, 
um, the match with Everton's, even the guys later down, the James Beatty. I mean, it was just fantastic. But, the, you know, the coach, Mr. Tony Pulis and his team was unbelievable. And in the end, we achieved lots of success. We FA Cup finals, we got promoted. Um, we played in Europe, scored in Europe. Um, so it was a massive, massive achievement, loads of strides. And it was, it was um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a joy to see where the club's at now. Yeah, and you know, just a little bit on the manager, you know, that brought you in because, as you know, the first season you had finished eighth, the next season you got promoted. Um, there was a, a a death in your family. He gave you time off to come to the island, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Trusted you, gave you that playing opportunities, even when there might be a spell of a couple of games without yeah. a goal. Yeah. Tony Clueless as a manager. Yeah. Well, top class, top class. As I say, football nowadays, well, how has that been? But if it, so, he was probably a little bit ahead of his time. It's my management skills. It's so much important, and as you can see now with Pep Guardiola, with Jurgen Klopp, you see how those guys are, and that's why they're getting all those energy back from the players and, and achieving all those success, no matter which club they, they, they represent or which club they're, they're in charge of. Um, so Mr. Pulis had that in him, and he was a hard manager, don't get me wrong, he knows how to challenge his players and he knows how to support his players. Fire and ice, that's how players grow, just like a plant needs water, and it needs sunlight. So the sunlight represents the challenge and the water represents the support or the fertilizer represents the support so that so you have growth. And if you don't have that, you can never improve, develop, improve and progress. And he had all of that. I mean, don't get me wrong, he was well ahead of his time because his preparation was different class. We are very well organized, as you can see, our team during that time, our set players, out of position when we lose the ball, or we were compact, or we were resilient, or we were together. Everybody, every player in every area of the field knows his, his role. We could play with the back blindfold closed, blindfold on, with our eyes closed. We know exactly what's going to happen. I know exactly what pass Liam is going to make. Soon as he soon as he recovers the ball, or we gain possession of the ball in transition, I know what runs to make because I know that ball was coming over. So arguably that's why we had so much success. So we had great we had great leadership, great preparation, we had great recruitment and he was that, he was a perfectionist. And when you have a manager like that, you're always gonna have success. And arguably and that's why he's never had he's never been relegated. I think he's the only manager, English manager, who was who was never relegated. I think Big Sam had that, but he was relegated with West Brom, I think. And I think David Morris had that. He was relegated with Sunderland. Yeah. Sunderland, exactly. So um He's the only manager now, up to, to date, who has never been relegated. So there is a reason for that. Success is not come easy. There's no, there's no reward. Oh, there's no reward without hard work and sacrifice. So he must be doing something right. And it felt like for the big games in particular that there was that that plan. Like when Arsenal came to town, you were on the score sheet. When Liverpool came to town, yes. like there was that Man plan City. for the, Man City in the FA yeah. Cup. You scored yes, as well. So it yeah. felt like there was that plan uh, for the big de the big uh, games. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Not only big games, as you see, I score against many teams. Um, I got teams on a few teams in the Premier League or in the Championship that I haven't scored against. Yeah. Um, well, I've scored against more most teams, um, mm -hmm. and obviously again, that's not that's not that's not um, lucky. That's not buck ups, as we say in Jamaica. Um, I must be doing something right. You know, I must be working hard enough. Um, and obviously, I've got the talent and and the, and, and, and the professionalism to do that, no matter what some people might think. But yes, um, I must be doing something right. But again, there's no reward without hard work, without sacrifice. <laughs> people see what is front of their eyes, but they don't see the work I was doing behind mm -hmm. the closed door. They don't see it the late hours that I've been leaving the training ground. They don't see the, the time when I'm injured and I'm going through rehabilitation for eight months, for nine months, how many times, um, and that I have to prepare myself and just the mental state alone. Any player would have quit a long time ago, but I managed to still keep going. That just shows and just proves the testament of the person and how resilient and my character of a person that I am. And therefore, there will be success when you have all those ingredients put together. Um, and I, I was all the type of player. I've always ambitious. I was always a person who want to, if I'm in the, the championship, I want to test myself in the Premier League. So I'll do everything within my power to get there and, and to test myself and to hold my own uh, and then push on from there. So I always know my capabilities. I always try to improve myself and advance myself as I'm doing now as an aspiring coach to be and manager to be. 
Yeah, I mean, during that time, you know, as well, you played with many, many different individuals. You had Richard Cresswell at one time, John Parkin at one time, Tunchai, Sidibe, James Beatty, Matthew Everington. Just in terms of those four front players, it seemed like there was a lot of interchange. Did you... Don't it it also fluid. Johnson. I can't so forget Idigo Johnson, yeah. Yeah, he came in as well and, and, and did quite a job as well because yeah. you had a lot of players that were with and around you. But I always felt that, you know, you didn't play with Tunchai quite often. Was that tactical? Yes, obviously it's the manager's decision for sure. Yeah. But he knows why. As I said, he knows his job, um, and he's a and he's a perfectionist. He's very much detailed, um, and he will he will try and mix and match players. I mean, obviously, don't forget we have to train and prepare ourselves before, so he will have a feel and a hand of knowing which players best work with which players. When we go on away games, strikers always be together in, in the room, so we have sometimes two players in rooms. And sometimes we've got one player's room, but even if we one player in each room, we represent each other. So therefore, we'll be going to a room, we'll be talking together. So his ways of, his reason why he, he does those things. So he knows what he was doing. Um, but yeah, he will know that, and it's his decision. But at the end of the day, no matter which player he came, because don't forget, a little man from Jamaica, who has never who has walked barefooted, who has never had great facilities, coming up against players like, especially when we got promoted, we had James, like players like James Beatty, who had been in the Premier League for a long time, who had had success in the Premier League. Massive club, Blackburn, Southampton. Mm -hmm. England international. We had players like Tunchai, mm -hmm. common England international. We had players like Tunchai, Turkish international, Fenerbahce, or Galatasaray, whatever team, that, or Besiktas, whichever team he was playing for. <laughs> there we have Eric Williamson, we talk about Chelsea, we talk about uh, Barcelona, and at one stage he was at Bolton as well, early in his career. Um, so all those players coming in, Thought they would have got my game, but I tell you what, none of them could have shaken me from that starting eleven because that's the belief and the confidence I have in my own ability. And I was fearless, I was brave, and I, you have to have those things. Um, and yeah, the manager know what type of player that was going to play with me because I know I was never going to be out of that starting eleven. It's only probably injuries or suspension would get me out, but once those things are over, I'm back in because that's the confidence and the belief I have in my own ability and my own strength, and that's the type of person I am. But yeah, the manager knew which type of player to play with, respect, with, with each other. We had Kevin Jones as well at one stage. But arguably, Mama Sidibe was my best partnership for sure because I think we have that connection. We have that he was the workhorse and I was the one who would pick up the pieces and I was the one who would create something out of nothing and who could play people in as well. Um, and I know, you know, just my intelligence in, in terms of football because on the field, my intelligence, I think, is nobody better than I. Obviously, injuries have decimated my career. I would have probably gone on and for, you know, you name it, teams at the top, uh, maybe in the Champions League as well, for sure. But I never say never. I keep going, coming back, keep bouncing back, keep working hard. And whenever, I, as I say, whenever situation I'm in, I'm always going to be that starting, that player in the starting level, that striker. That's always going to be in the team too because that's my belief and ambition. During the time at Stoke, did you ever get opportunities or inquiries to go to a team that might be playing Europa League or Champions League during that time? Uh, of, of course, of course. Uh, I said before, when I was at Preston, my first season at Preston, I was at what? Eight goals in, in 14 games. I was flying, absolutely flying. Um, and that was only, that was only November. And um, Gerard Hule came in calling six million quid with Phil Graham, met him. So January, you know, deal would have come because the window would have opened in January. i never forget on 30th of November against Coventry. Big Serbian defender, Konjic. Remember playing for commentary, he went to put the ball, flick it on. So he had, he was late, so he, his forehead caught me in my head back because I actually reached the ball first, flick it on. So I was unconscious in the air. You could see from the video, fell on the ground, my body went one way, my leg went one way, ruptured my ACL. So that was my luck, you know, as I say, I never had any, I mean, actually I'm blessed to be still playing and achieve all that I did eventually. But I just, in that, in those moments, I just say that I'm, I'm without luck because Every single time it seems like as a big club was coming in, I always get injured. You always get injured. I mean, even when I arrive at Stoke, if it was not Mr. Pulis and some other manager being the way they were, or they would have been, or they are, I probably wouldn't be in the end of the, ended up at Stoke and achieve all that I did because I didn't pass I didn't pass the medical. Yeah, because of the, all the injuries and the hole in my cartilage and the spinal fusion that I and don't forget when I came on trial. I had five goals in three games for Charlton Athletic. Rip up the trial, the trial. I don't think there's any trialists who have done that. Well, across the world, never, let alone Jamaica. 
you know, we've seen them in try this goal now, and can't even, you know, no, no disrespect to the players, but having problems trying to be signed. So that t that, that proved a testament of how well I did back then. So I had a trick against Watford, one against Southampton, one against Leicester. Those are Premier League teams at the time. Don't forget that time the reserve was actually the players coming out of the first team was injured or coming back or who haven't been playing regularly in the first team. So it was very, very competitive. <laughs> Talking about playing against Matt Letizier, Noel Williams, Bath Noel Williams for Watford, you know what I mean, all those games. Um, yeah, and I failed a medical. And I signed, signed for 1.35 million pounds for Charlton Athletic at the time. Alan Kirby was the manager. And I failed a medical. Curry was, uh, was taken away from me. Yeah. Then Gerard Hule came in when I was at Preston flying eight goals in 14 games. In January, transfer had gone through six million quid. Got injured. It's countless times, countless times. Um, even, when, even when I went to Portsmouth, my knee acted up. I only get to score one goal in the Premier League. Seven or uh, eight penalties. Yakubu and, and Lua Lua scoring them. But I only managed one goal. Then Sunderland came in again, failed the medical when I was going staying in the Premier League. So that's why I ended up at Southampton. Because I failed the medical going to Sunderland. Mick McCarthy was the manager then. He was gutted. He, he was out of his decision. But I don't think he had many, many talk back then. Because he still wanted to sign me. Because obviously, you know, he, went down to become Wolves manager and every time I play against his team I kill them I kill them figuratively speaking I always scored <laughs> against them you know what I mean so so he's always you know as a manager he's, he's always had love for me and liking for me and my style of playing whatever so injury have decimated my career but I never gave up I, I keep on coming back keep on bouncing back and and, and that and that is obviously a testament to me as a person my character my resilience and my hard work um, so yes, I, I've always been that type of person. But yeah, I've, I've never managed to, to have the opportunity to play for a bigger team because of injuries. And, and that's just my faith. And I accept that. But one thing for sure, I was never going to give up. If I can't get there by somebody buying me, I'm going to get my team there. And that's what I did, that's what I did with Stoke City. And we, uh, we got on to do 10 years in the Premier League. You know, I spent a good chunk of my career, six years in my um, with Stoke. We've had four years in the, I've had four years in the Prem, and the club has gone on to another another six years. And I think is arguably I think seven or within ten teams that has done ten years in the Premier League. So that is an achievement within itself for Stoke City. And as you know, it's it's the best feeling in the world when you're appreciated, and you spend six seasons at a club. You have some players that might have spent a little longer than you. But you were an individual that was voted in the club's Hall of Fame, so I'm sure that is something that you're humbled about. Absolutely humble and honoured. Absolutely humble and it's absolute privilege, and it's such a pleasure to be honoured. So much I'm very delighted because why I say that is because you know I always say from nothing to something, meaning that I started back in Jamaica. I remember Jamaica is a terrible country. I never owned a football boot when I was a kid growing up because my family never had it like that. Uh, obviously, you want to say, uh, well, I'm born and bred in Tivoli Gardens, poor neighborhood. Uh, my family was a hard working Christian family. Um, but certain things, money had to be spent, and most things that was most important, you know, how it, how it is back home. Um, so, for me, it came from that setting and to achieve that status in this club's history because of all of obviously my hard work, my togetherness with my group leadership of, of the of the of, of the manager and the ownership as well of the club of the coach family to be a part of that the Stanley Matthews the Sir God the Sir Stanley Matthews the Sir God the Banks you know um, all those great players you know um, to be a part of that is no easy feat it's a boy from Jamaica don't forget that a boy who never owned the football boots his first football boots was, a, was borrowed from a girl called Marie in his neighborhood who played softball the other side of baseball for, for the girls. Um, and yeah, looking back and, and, and to all that I have achieved and all that I've been voted and, and to put against or, or, or amongst, I should say, rather, it's, it's such a great achievement and, and an overwhelming feeling. Um, knowing all that I've been through as well, don't forget the injuries and the setbacks, um, obviously messed up, um, affected my international career as well. As you can see, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. It's not easy to keep bouncing back, keep bouncing back. Um, psychologically, all that, you know, all the effects from that. Uh, physically, all the effects from that. Trust me, the whole thing when you look back, 
it's a great, great, phenomenal, unbelievable achievement. And one that I'm humbled and honored and grateful and thankful for. And when you look at back at that experience as well, you had a couple of top 10 finishes in the league that run to the FA Cup final, yep. going to the latter stages of the Europa League. Yep. When you reflect on that, do you say, you know, we should I achieve a little bit more? Or for a club of, of Stoke's nature and stature at the time, that was success in a sense? Massively overachievement. It is success, but massively overachievement. Don't forget, I told you where we were coming from. No the training girl. there wasn't that you subscribe at that, at that time. They weren't 7 billion or 10 billion in worth at the moment as they are, you know? <laughs> so when I came here, I never forget, the chairman himself, Mr. Peter Cole, said it in the paper. The club was 8.9 million in debt, in debt. Yeah. And, 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 and they, they got the last 500,000. And he said to Mr. Pulis, said, I need, it, I need this striker. I need 500,000 to buy this striker. And don't forget, they've got me for little or nothing. Yeah? With all due respect, you know what I mean? And I took a 40% pay cut to actually arrive and to come to the, to the football club. So, from where we're coming from, what we achieve, winning football matches in Europe, getting to an FA Cup finals, arguably should have won that on that day because we had the better chances earlier on in the game. Scoring in Europe, myself personally, we score goals in Europe. This is Stoke City we're talking about. Yes, we have a great history, because 1972 we won the, the, cup, the cup with Mr. Terry Conrad scoring the winner. Um, I think we get to Chelsea out there. And um, we had players like the Sir Gordon Banks, which was standing matches, great history. And also the club was the, one of the founders of the league. Yeah, The club was one of the Stokes in Preston, I think Nuts County, and Nottingham Forest. So we had a Derby, I think, was one of the other clubs. So Stoke City was one of the founders of the league with all those great history as well. But in recent history and in terms of European football and scoring in Europe, winning football matches in Europe, in recent history where the club was coming from with all the facilities that we never had to what we have now, massive achievement, massive achievement. <laughs> In the time that you, and in in the time that you had there as well, Demar Phillips was there briefly as well with you. Was it injuries? Why you think perhaps he didn't kick on at Stoke and had that move over to Norway in that period of time? Well, Rudolf of Austin as well. Um, mm. He was here on Charlie Top. In fact, we tried we, we signed him and failed failed the failure, failure, work, work on criteria. Try to sign him two or three times because the gaffer loves him. Um, it's a style of play. With Mr. Pulis, you know, we need to be physical, brave, physical. We need to be aggressive, we need to be intense, we need to be very fit, we need to play with speed, penetration and width, create lots of crossing, to create goals going up opportunities. That's Mr. Tony Pulis' style of play. Um, Demar was quick, but he wasn't the strongest, he wasn't the tallest. But nevertheless, we need to be more brave, we need to be more aggressive. Because we had Glenn Whelan, he wasn't the tallest, but he was brave, he was aggressive, he was physical. And when you don't have certain other attributes, you got to compensate with the others that you have. Demar Phillips had speed, had a great left peg. He was accurate. He could shoot. He could cross, but he was a bit lightweight. And I think that's why eventually he never got, he never get to get the opportunities because without the opportunities of playing time, you ain't gonna show what you can do. I think if you if you got more opportunities in terms of playing time, the gaffer would have seen more what you can do. But knowing you know the gaffer judge people of training sessions. That's how he is. Um, and you know we train as we play. In training, everybody has to wear shoot pads. In training, we'll have lots of bus stop because people are flying in. We have so many fights. Every day, actually, we ever got a fight in training because players was flying in. Player was hard, player was physical, player was aggressive. You know, we had speed, we had energy, we had, we, you know, lots of enthusiasm, um, and, and we have lots of quality. That's our training session, week in, week out, day in, day out. Um, and the gaffer will judge his players from the training session, and then you got the games. Them are played in played in lots of the, the reserve games and the under twenty three games at the time, but you got to show those those qualities. You got to show those those values, and if you're not showing them, then you're not, you ain't going to get the opportunity to play in the game in the in the reserve games, much less in the in the, in the first team game. I think he played a couple cup games, um, but again, when you play more, young players need to play, and if he plays more, he will be able, be able to get more confident. And from confidence, he will be able to play his, his, his own game, which we know he can play, but he never got those opportunities because of other stuff. So eventually, he never got the, the chance to, for him to really showcase what he had. When he actually went to Norway, 
uh, in Norway or Sweden. Norway, Norway. Yeah. When he went to Norway, he actually got the playing time because obviously the quality, no disrespect to that league, but the quality ain't going to be the same. Um, so he got the opportunity and he and he built from that. He got the confidence and he showed what he could do. I think he got player of the year and he won yeah. the trophies there. So we don't get the opportunities, then you ain't going to get a chance to show what you can do. Rudolf Austin now was different. You know, Rudolf was brave, was aggressive, was physical. No wonder why the gaffer tried to sign him two or three times. And luckily, we never got the work permit. And he come, he went on to do his stuff in Norway again, didn't he? And then he came back for, for, for Leeds. And he was brilliant at Leeds. We, they loved him, you know, because of his style of play. So Rudolf, in other words, that them are fit the English game. Them are never really fit the English game because of the physicality, the aggression, or bravery of the be the tempo, intensity, and the hard work that, that it requires. Don't get me wrong, they were always very fit and work hard, but it's not as physical and brave and aggressive. Yeah, and I'm sure you heard from the outside world, other clubs and media talking about the style of play of Stoke. Were the players phased by that or they just said, we're just going to buy into this vision of the manager and do our best, in a sense? Absolutely. That's what you just said that last bit. We knew who we were. We knew our capabilities. We work hard. We were intense. We proved ourselves knowing the gaffer, Mr. Tony Pulis. We advance our abilities. We work on our weaknesses, improve them, and we build on our strengths. That's Stoke City and the player during my time or during my era. That's us in a nutshell. We were far, we were intense. We play with speed and penetration. We play with whiff and we play, create lots of crossing situations and we create goal scoring opportunities and we take most of them. You see the James beating myself, Mama City B. And one time you see the ball comes in, we're scoring from ahead and we're scoring from across Marshall Everington, German Pennant. We always have wingers because that's how we play. We play with intensity, we play with penetration, with speed. You know, when we lose possession or, or when we lose, when we gain or lose possession of the ball in transition or we get back into position, um, defensive position and how we were organised, how we were compact, how we were resilient to get after the ball when we lose the possession. When we gain possession, how we quickly transfer into that into that attacking position, we create the width, we opened up, ball was played with speed and penetration or play wide with speed so that we could get crossing opportunities where we could score from. So we, that was us in a nutshell. We weren't the, the team that's going to spend 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 million pounds at a time because we're Stoke City. So we cannot play to who we were not. We have to play to who we are. So therefore we have to buy into who we were and the gaffer, that comes that comes from the gaffer, his leadership qualities, what he knew what he was doing and we buy into that as players and we work on socks off in training because one thing for sure, we ain't going to get done for being the, the, the least of, or, or the least, fit, uh, well, we're going to be done. We're not going to be done for being not fit. We're going to be the fittest team and that's what we were. And from fitness comes everything else. We were brave, we were aggressive, we were, we play with speed, we play with energy. You know, uh, we play with whiff, we play with penetration. And on set plays, we were well drilled. You know, we were organized, we know exactly what we were going to do. Uh, and, and we were well prepared. So therefore, we buy into who we were. And if we're going to be like that, therefore you got to have six footers. you got to have star players, you got to have strong players, you got to have players who are aggressive, who are brave. you got to recruit players who play like that, to fit your system, to fit your style of play. And you know who you are, and once you buy into that and play to the strength, the world is at your feet and we go on to achieve, as I said, in my time I believe we overachieved. Yeah, yeah great things. Sure. And now, you know, you're in a position where you have some, I don't want to say familiar faces, but faces that you'll know right now. We spoke briefly about Luke Bradley Morgan in the academy right now at Stoke, you know, he represented under 20 regular boys. The first team, the captain in Lewis Baker, Jamaican Heritage, uh, Tyrese Campbell as well, you know, Dwight Gale. Uh, and, and amongst other Dijon Sterling as well so I'm sure at some point you might have brief conversations with them about Jamaica generally speaking oh yes oh yes I've, se I've seen them um, in fact I didn't realize I know the, 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 the surname of some J J uh, Jamaican affiliation or heritage but obviously when we're driving up and you're telling me obviously I know Lewis Baker uh, but I didn't know D Dijon Sterling was um, um, and Dwight Gale. Uh, Dwight Gale. No, I know Dwight Gale. Uh -huh. I obviously know yeah. about him. Badly oh, Morgan. St uh, Luke. Luke, yeah. Yeah, Luke. Um, I saw him and I thought, he looks familiar. But obviously because there's so much going on, and so much to read, so much to take in, because I've only just uh, been at the club last week, and I've got the Premier League side as well, as well I've got the club to deal with. Uh, I've got lots of uh, safeguarding, reading, lots of um, stuff to do, work with it each to, throughout the academy structure with different, different, different age groups. So it's a lot going on at the minute. So, yeah, but obviously when you mentioned those guys, I straight, oh yeah, actually we got quite a few. 
Um, but yeah, they, they've got the ability. You know, Sterling, Lujan is doing very, very, very well so far. What I've seen of him, because I go to the home games and, and the games that I've seen him so far has been doing brilliantly. And the gaffer loves him, you can see. Uh, Mr. Alex Neal. Um, um, you got Lewis Baker, who is the club captain, leading from the front, who has been tremendous since he arrived at the club. Uh, obviously, you know, obviously, you know, he came from a great youth system, a great setup, a great academy in Chelsea, and he had experience of playing in Holland and all the other places, Middlesbrough and all the other clubs. So, um, and yeah, and now we and we got Dwight Gale, who has been there, done that in the leagues. So, I mean, we got we got we got great potential if we can manage to recruit these guys for the national team. I tell you what, and with the leadership of this new manager now, um, the Icelandic Icelandic manager, we've got a great pedigree. I, mean, I must say, it's a great appointment from the. Jamaica Football Federation Administration, it's a great appointment. Um, so yeah, if we could manage to get these guys in before, it'd be a great, great addition to, 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 to the country, to Jamaica, and I'm sure they, they, will be do, they, they will do well for the club at Stoke City. Did you have an opportunity to watch the game that we played last month against Argentina, or even highlights of it? Yes, I saw highlights of it. Highlights of it, but again, yeah, uh, should have, could have done a little bit better. Unfortunately for the goals, a little bit lapsed, but yeah, I mean, th those are things, those goals came from mistakes and, and, and situations where this manager now will, will, he will sort out for sure because he knows his game, he knows his stuff, he's got his work, he, he has worked with teams like obviously Iceland who was similar to our setup in terms of the facility, well not the facility, but in terms of the population and style of play, the underdog kind of mentality that we have. So and and the talented players that we have, that you know, obviously playing in here in England, and the ones that's that's um, what should I say? That's capable because remember, if you play for the national team, you got to be capable. It's not any anybody you can have played for the national team, whether it be local players or players from here in England or in the MLS or across the world. We've got the Jamaican heritage, so it will it will have the players to work with and sort out all those problems. But again, we, I don't I don't think we did um, pretty badly in that game. I think we did well. Um, and could have had a better result. And for you, how encouraging is it to see to see some Jamaicans in the league now, Leon Bailey, Aston Villa, Antonio, West Ham, Bobby Reid, Fulham, Jamalo, Bournemouth, because at one stage it was like you and Marlon King in a league, and this was yes. a decade ago. At one yes. stage, Marlon King at Hall, you at Stoke, yes. you know, at one stage in the league. Uh, abso Bibi. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and back then, we used to have players, we used to have yeah. players like, um, we had German Johnson, we had uh, 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 Paul Davis, we had we had um, De uh, um, Damien, Damien Stewart, yeah. two P's. Omar Daly. We had Omar Daly. We had um, Rudolf Austin, obviously not, not too long ago. So after a while it became, as you, as you know, you just said it, me and Marlon King, myself and Marlon King. And then, and then we have um, Little Butch, there's nobody that was hanging around. So now, we, you know, as you can see, it's, 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 it look, it's looking very bright again. Obviously, these players are kind of getting on in age, to be fair. Obviously, the Mikel Antonio, the Bobby Reed, but we still have the Leon Baileys, we have the Lou coming through, we have the Lewis Baker, we have all those guys coming through. Uh, do I get them with a little bit age, in age coming on? But at least we have, right now, that core of players we can get some immediate success from, or we, or, or I should say, short term success from, and hopefully these guys can push through the other guys that's coming through with their experience and exposure and obviously give back something to that um, younger group coming through and to make that team stronger. And I'm sure this, this coach, as I said, this coach is capable and competent enough to, to, to have a plan to get these guys to kind of create that conveyor belt where that wheel keeps turning. So when Mikel and Tony went on, went on, uh, or should I, no, when Mikel and Tony push on from obviously a player, um, he will have that players coming through just like when we went on, we didn't have for that a little period, we didn't have enough, nobody really coming through. Um, especially from Jamaica, making that um, transition to England. I know the, the restraints are there because of work permit criteria and all the other things, that's the barriers that's holding back players, obviously. But you've got players now going to other parts of Europe and players going now in the MLS um, as such. Um, that might have been moved, but Europe is probably best, like Slovenia, to get them the experience. You've got Norway still. That um, I think Scotland has kind of opened up, so hopefully we can get some more players in to create that conveyor belt because it's important to have that players coming through, producing players, you know, year after year, yeah, um, period after period, era after era, because we want to, we don't want to go through that gap where we don't have enough, nobody coming through, and we have got player aging, and therefore you're gonna have to stand still, you're gonna have, we're gonna be stagnant. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't want to have that. 
you had that experience at Hearts as well, you know, and yeah. you know, for England, you have to be in the top 50 in the ranking. Scotland, it's a slightly different top 70. So, would you recommend any person from the island to experience Scotland, despite the weather and everything? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, in fact, when when I knew of the situation quite a while back, um, obviously with my affiliation with the Hearts, we had um, my ex teammate actually. Neil Robin Houston is actually the manager and and the, 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 the recruitment, one of the recruitment guy, um, I knew him very well from the time of Preston and obviously with the name that I have and how long I've been in the game and in the country, I know quite a few people. So um, I give Damien Law, uh, it was Damien Law, Vasso, Peter Lee Vasso, um, Norman Campbell, I presented their name to Hearts because I thought, you know, obviously well, with the structure Hearts and the, the Scottish Premier League at the minute in terms of wages and everything it's a little bit a barrier in terms of if you're getting decent monies elsewhere you know to come here yes we try to make it realistic and in terms of them having a look in because this is, could be like a pathway to come into England so my thinking was get them try and get them a look in even in a trial situation where maybe the club could say oh, the club could say okay because of my ex team Robin Nielsen arts have been part of my history I've done fairly well for the club people there still appreciate me so try to use my contacts in getting the players in you know even though the wage is not the best um, probably to where they are hot um, but come have a year or two do well and then you will have players from uh, clubs in England looking in because a lot of players we talk about Van Dyke we talk about myself we talk about so many other players come from Scotland all the leagues they're coming to England and do very well for themselves um, so it's not a bad, a bad, a bad channel, a bad, a, 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 not a bad league that you can take players from rather than the MLS and Norway or, or Sweden and other places because of obviously the restriction and the work permits criteria and it's been relieved in Scotland. Um, that's, that was my line of thinking. But in the end it never materialised for Damien and for Norman Campbell went on to Slovenia. Damien I think left Egypt and went on to um, into Miami. And then Peter Vasa, I think he went on. We tried to get him to to Rudolf Club in Denmark as well, but it never materialised at the last end. I think we break down at the last the last hurdle, the contract talks, and then he ended up went on to the USL team. Yeah. So yeah, but it would be it's a shame because um, that was my thinking. Uh, so it wouldn't be a bad channel to come to to go to because a lot of the English clubs take players from the Scottish League, and those players have come here and do very well. Yeah, and you mean. The experiences that you've had with the national team as well, what would you say was the reason why perhaps you didn't get the same numbers like a Shelton or an Anandilo? Would it be the system that you played in because the technical ability was there that you had, but not necessarily the same numbers like an Andy or a Shelton per se, you know? Yeah, well... Um, I mean, you spoke about injuries earlier as well. Yeah, as I said before, um, when you play... Remember, I was ripping it up for under 20s. I've got 14 goals in 14 games. And um, my career started for the senior team with injuries. I went to uh, Shell Cup in Trinidad, where basically my hip, I had problems with my hip, and, uh, and I think I should have came off then, but Samoa's wanted me to stay on the pitch because I was taking over from Walter Boyd at the time. And they put the number 10 on my back, massive pressure. And I just felt like I never recovered from that injury. And a lot of it's, it, it caused a lot of other injuries to come. Because when you're young and you don't correct certain situations in terms of injuries it could go on or springboard into other you picking up other injuries especially my spine my hip and i played that game smooth had me on the pitch played that game and i was out for another three months after that where i was wearing a, 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 a corset a brace thing like for my hip because of the damage that was done um never recovered from that so eventually i end up coming back and playing and recovering and gone on to do very well for a club in the other later part of the other 23s, went to games in in, in Africa, in Scandinavia with the national team, Samoa's obviously trying to break me in, put uh, and fourth, obviously take it over with the number 10 because he saw that I had the potential. So eventually, but so in, injuries, my massive problem was, this is no excuse, mm -hmm. in, in, injuries played a massive part of uh, decimating my career for my country and obviously I haven't got the time to spend with players. So again, remember, I've spent so much time with my club. So I know these boys inside out. Yeah. 
when you're playing for your country, if you look at my performance, performance wasn't a problem for the national team. He scored goals, could have and should have scored more goals for sure. I have to accept that, 100%. Um, but scoring goals, there's much more to scoring goals. There's what happened before you actually score goals. There's the preparation. There's the, together, the togetherness. There's the, there's the, 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 the recruitment. There's players that plays with players. You got to know what players to play with who and how to play with who. And we have a lot, it's a combination of things. And we're seeing that now in the national team. We see, we see the recruitment where we have so many English players coming in at one time just before the, the qualification. How are they going to have togetherness? How are they going to have cohesiveness? And that's what happens to team. And the outcome will be if you don't have a team put together for a while to play with teams. So I think my biggest problem was I could have, should have scored more goals and I didn't manage to get that. But my performance was a problem because if you look, in most of the games I was playing well, I was creating chances, creating chances, I was scoring here and there. But on a consistent basis, I never managed to score as many goals as I would love and like to. Well, the entire package, as I said before, um, recent, recent um, situations, or recent appointments that the Jamaica Football Federation has, has made, as, as, as you can see, you can see it's the. It's the appointment of the new coach, which is a brilliant appointment, I think, I believe, especially for Jamaica um, at the minute, and the short-term and long-term goal, for sure, this, this coach can get us to where we need to be. Um, um, and obviously with the, the uh, GenSec appointment, I think that's a brilliant appointment from Mr. Chong, Mr. Dennis Chong. Yeah. When you look at his CV and I've seen some interviews with him, I like what he's saying. Uh, they say all the stuff that I've heard about him, nothing short of exceptional and a man full of integrity and, and the belief and you can see that he loved the sport and he, he knows a man that knows the sport as well. And it's good when you have people in the department who knows what they're doing. The division of labour have to be specialised. That way the outcome will be great. The, 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 the manufacturing will be good. The product you produce will be top class, will be quality. Um, so the recent appointments are, you know, it's really good to see and it's a, it's a bit of fresh air. The manager and the job set. Um, we can keep going in this way with this, uh, with this current administration. Yes, I bash them because I believe they were doing the right things. When you look at all that we have been going through, all that we have achieved from the time, from then till now, um, all the incompetence, all the ineptitude, I would say yes, it's a, it's a struggle and it's something that we don't want to see. But yes, if we can manage to put things right where, 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 where the leadership is concerned, the preparation is concerned, the recruitment is concerned, yeah, the outcome will be good, the outcome could be great, the outcome will be great, and that's where we have to start from. So we have to get the right people in the right positions, and people knows what they're doing, and people willing to work hard. Because don't forget, as I said before, it's not about talent, Talent is just a basic requirement. It's the mental toughness that decide the real winners. It's hard work, whatever you do. It's discipline. It's sacrifice. So not only just the administration, but the playing side of things. It's it's perseverance. It's a love for the people who love the sport. Yeah, you got to have the, the skill and the will. But the will has to be stronger than the skill in every department. Don't forget, we got the administration. We got the playing. We got the we got the HR, we got the we got the equipment managers. Everybody have to pull it in one way. Everybody have to put work together as a unit to achieve the goal, whether it be at club level or whether it be at international level. If we can manage to, to do achieve those things, then we will have success. No doubt. We will have success. Hi guys, I'm Ricardo Fuller and you're watching Reggae Boys Commentary. Like, share and subscribe. Hi everybody, I'm Darren Moore and you're watching Reggae Boys Commentary. Yes, Reggae Boys Commentary, like and subscribe, yeah? Oh. Reggae Boys Commentary, like, share and subscribe. Reggae Boys Commentary, <laughs> subscribe, like and share.